Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. Before starting China Uncensored, I worked as a script writer for a show called Journey to the East, a TV documentary series about traditional Asian culture and the people carrying it on today. Unfortunately, the show was scrapped before ever making it on air. Not long ago, I posted one of the never aired episodes, The Truth Behind Traditional Chinese Kung Fu. The response to that was so incredible that I decided to post more. This one is about traditional Japanese carpentry. Without the use of any nails, they can build temples that last for hundreds of years. It's a fascinating look at a not quite lost art. I hope you enjoy. Traditional Japanese carpenters build furniture, houses, and temples without the aid of screws, nails, or bolts. No, no bolts, no nails. Last longer. Even Japan tower, temple tower, thousand years is still standing. We have a two things in that our human you know, history, against the nature, with nature. You have to choose either one. So we do more, more natural side, you know, real craftsmanship side. The finished pieces reflect the ancient philosophy of Japanese carpentry that is still alive today. My father actually grew up doing woodcut prints. This is something that they did in the old country. They always learned a trade. So some people were farmers, some people were electricians. But he chose woodworking. When I graduate, I have to set it up on my life where to stay, to work. So I say, oh, this is very easy. I want to get homesick. I want to know home more. If you stay, you don't know too much because you are blind spots. Far away, you can see. So I decided to leave from Japan to somewhere. Hisao Hanafusa has been working with Japanese carpentry for over 50 years. With his son, he now runs Mia Shoji, a traditional Japanese carpentry workshop in New York. One day I was walking on 17th Street and I saw their beautiful tables inside. And I went in to look and I said to him, I met Mr. Hanafuse and I said, one day I'm going to own one of your tables. And of course, being a good salesman, he said, why not now? And uh, when I met Ken, my husband, and we decided we would start another life together, we both wanted to change the way we were living. I wanted to simplify, you know? I just wanted to simplify my life. All the pieces in Hanafusa's showroom have been handcrafted using traditional Japanese techniques. 
The pieces of lumber have also been individually selected by Hanafusa and his son. Every morning, Hanafusa's team of carpenters begin by sharpening the blades of their hand-forged planes and chisels. Caring for these hand tools takes almost as much time as using them. But in the right hands, the Japanese hand plane produces a smoother cut than a machine plane. As the blade passes through these shoji screen beams, it cleanly slices off thin ribbons of wood. The process of using and caring for these traditional tools reflects Hanafusa's philosophy of working with nature, not against nature. We have a two things in that our human you know, history, against the nature, with nature. You have to choose either one. When I was a kid, study Industrial Revolution, fantastic stuff, but that kills all the craftsmen, all the personal, individual talent, they kill. So we do more more natural side, you know, real craftsmanship side. That's we're still doing it. Some people say stupid. <laughs> I knew of Mr. Hanafusa. So um, I would go by the place with my children. We look in the windows and there were plenty of screens and the, and the furniture were, was all there. So when we started talking about how we were going to decorate this apartment after we bought it, he became a given. What we did initially was go to Mr. Hanafusa's workshop and we chose the piece of lumber we wanted for the table. The wood carpentry in the past, the wood within the area, would actually dictate what the actual carpenter can make. We actually practice the same thing here, where wood in the area we collect would dictate what the actual client can actually have. Oh, we're taking down an elm tree and giving it a second life. We're gonna slab these branches in the big trunk and Someday it'll become furniture. It was hit with a disease known as Dutch elm disease, which devastates elm trees. It survived the first bout of Dutch elm, which came through here over 30 years ago. Unfortunately, uh, we've been hit with Dutch elm disease once again, and the tree didn't survive. This tree is approximately 300 years old. It's a shame to see it go. This is real specialty work. It takes a lot of wherewithal to tackle a tree like this, not to mention the equipment to be able to manufacture it into slabs of wood. Although, you know, this tree is dead, it's always living. 
in the spring and summer it it breathes it picks up moisture and in the winter it loses moisture so just think of it as something that's always living two slabs out of that and that's the center of the tree at the museum. Right? Everywhere beautiful. After the tree has been milled into slabs, it has to go through a drying process for many years before it is ready to be made into furniture. The fresh tree, water content like a hundred percent, right? Ready to use it is, you, you have to remove uh, water content. That's why 10, 15, 20 year air dry, you watch it, ready to use it or not. By the time the wood first hits the cutting bench, it is already nearing the end of its journey. At this stage, the carpenter begins to craft the joints that will hold the finished piece together like a three-dimensional puzzle without the need for screws, nails, or bolts. The joints must fit together perfectly, which is all the more difficult to achieve when using hand saws and chisels instead of precise electric tools. These butterfly joints will prevent the crack in this tabletop from spreading. This rectangular dining table has an extremely simple and elegant design. The base consists of two wide legs attached to a long trestle by two mortise and tenon joints. And the legs hold the top in place with four dowels. Although it is extremely heavy, the table is held together with only four pieces of lumber and six joints. New construction is usually with nails, bolts, screws, but we still actually use joinery, which would be wood and wood expanding and contracting with each other. So this is actually something that lasts forever. No, no bolts, no nails. Lasts longer, also strong for earthquake, hurricane, even Japan, tower, temple tower, thousand years is still standing. The techniques for building Buddhist temples originally came from China's Tang Dynasty era in the 6th and 7th centuries AD. This period is considered China's golden age, where art and religion flourished. The mastery of joinery can be seen in the interlaced wooden brackets that support the temple's wide roof with a minimal number of columns and give the visitors an unobstructed view of the Buddha statue. Like the Buddhist temples, traditional Japanese homes and furniture are also held together with wooden joints and reflect the aesthetic values 
of simplicity, modesty, and appreciation of nature. Designing in a Japanese fashion or, or wanting to live that life entails a certain quest for simplicity. It's easier to be eclectic, and it can be wonderful and beautiful to be eclectic, but it's not part of anything permanent. The Japanese design is what it is. I mean, it goes way back, and it doesn't change. And I think you, you want to be as true as you can be to that, that vision and that philosophy. When you close, you, you don't see the other side. So it's just a paper, but paper makes a different space. I call mysterious space. We don't know is very mysterious, I think. Just like a life, we don't know tomorrow. Ten years later, you exist, you don't know. Maybe we don't exist. This is also can take her off. No hardware. Gravity sliding. Wood frame, shadow groove, deeper groove, no hardware. Chopstick, knife and fork, that's different. Bottom of the door or screen, uh, bottom of the tree. Tree grows this, tree grow, don't grow upside down. So th this is all same tree grow. So it doesn't warp. If you upside down, you know, mix it, they warp. This is basically with nature, not against the nature process. The shoji screens, they offer a, a really wonderful diffused light. It offers a serenity. It's like our sanctuary when we come here. And I think that's in part because of the shoji screens. I was looking for a space that was more visually peaceful and actually a space that would get me away from my Western New York busy life into a more contemplative, meditative space. My current apartment was almost the opposite. Uh, I've been collecting American ephemera stuff for about 30 years. So it's all over my apartment. And if you go into the Japanese uh, apartment, there's absolutely nothing that's visible or discreet. I find this space very peaceful and relaxing and I often go there to meditate. You close the Soji screens and all of New York is now disappeared. You can be anywhere in the world. It's almost sort of like a little spaceship where you, uh, a little time traveling. Matter of fact, people from Japan who've seen this space said, wow, that's so, that's so cool, Sugoi. Once all the joints have been carved and fitted together, the pieces are hand planed to a flat, smooth finish. And coated with many layers of traditional tongue oil, made from the seeds of the tongue tree. The finished table is then assembled. In this folding table, the legs fold out via dowels. 
and are held in place by small wooden pegs. The top is joined to the frame with four sliding dovetail joints. The genius of the table lies in the flexible wooden beam that holds the legs securely open or closed with the help of joints on the base and legs. <laughs> Everything and it's done in a very traditional, traditional way that lends itself to pride in what you do, pride in the job. And that pride is reflected in the quality of the things that we have in our home that make our lives wonderful and beautiful, easy to live in. So it arrived one day when Hanafusa's men showed up at the apartment. They would stop at our door, they would remove their shoes, they would bow. You know, they, like they honored the space itself by being so traditionally Japanese. They have a reverence for their materials, for the space, for what they're doing, and we can feel that. Using the table after they have put so much care into making it, you can feel it. it comes through. I can't say why I chose the Japanese. I, that's why I think it's just something, it's something in me that came from some remote place. I can only think that if there were an afterlife, then perhaps I was Japanese in some other culture, because it, it really comes from something very innate. Hanafusa is really a philosopher. And I think what we have in common is that he's an artist and I'm an artist. So I think he's a purist. I think when you're an artist, I mean, you strive for some kind of truth and consistency. The concept of beauty in traditional Japanese design is different from that in the West. Subtle imperfections and signs of age or weathering are prized. They inspire the viewer to contemplate the passage of time and the imperfect nature of life. A truly beautiful object should inspire a feeling of serene loneliness and quiet self-reflection. In Japanese, this aesthetic is called wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi, talking of beauty, talking of life, many different kind of beauty. Antique beauty, rustic beauty, fresh beauty, young beauty. It, it's very abstract, wide. Doesn't say this. When I go to Japan, people say, well, you came back uh, bad season, rain. You can't go anywhere. No, I designed that way to see the raining day. You live there, you don't notice. You don't have to go raining day. Next tomorrow, maybe clear day. But wet temple, wet garden, and no people because of rain. I think that's more beauty. <laughs> <laughs> 